Welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast with Stuart Fensterheim, LCSW, your source for the latest tips and practical down-to-earth advice on creating emotionally connected, thriving relationships. Now, here's Stuart. Hi there, and welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast. This is Stuart Fensterheim, the Couples Expert. I am so excited to be here again today. And part of that is because I have just finished up my two day seven conversation weekend. And there were couples that came to join me. And at that time, they came in totally absorbed and negative about their relationship and not feeling like anything can make a difference. They thought they had a very clear idea of who their partner is, the strengths, weaknesses, and that they know them so well that they can even finish their sentences. They know what they're going to say even before they open their mouth. And lo and behold, by the time this weekend was over, they said, gosh almighty, I feel so lost. I'm in a fog. I'm confused because who I thought my partner was isn't who they were. And you know what? That's what it takes. That's what it takes to really understand the power of a weekend experience like this, because you get to find out that your partner has some of the same needs that you do. We talk about attachment needs and what it takes to really establish a healthy relationship and one in which you and your partner know that you're there for one another and will love each other and that there's nothing more important than your partner meeting your attachment needs. And not only that, the two of you understand why you're not able to connect and what it's going to take to solve that problem. And that's the excitement of this podcast and the excitement of the daily YouTube videos that I'm now doing, giving tidbits on ways to have a close connected relationship is I get to share with my audience my insights and my love for couples, relationships, and that there is power in it that can change the world. And we talked and reflected toward the end of the weekend, actually, that my passion for this is so great because I know that if I can help couples have that close connected relationship, gang warfare, violence, prejudice, racism, all of those things, they're about feeling alone and not knowing if the world is a good place or a bad place. And if you have a connected relationship with your family, with people in your life, you know that you can do anything that you set your mind to. And that's what we have to offer here at the Couples Expert Podcast, a beginning of that trend. So my mission is to help all of you really understand what happens that may get in the way of you feeling close. And that's really a good lead in for today. Let's talk about today's topic. Today's topic, uh, and I've titled the podcast, Don't Fish Off the Company Pier. And the reason for that is it's an expression that's been around a while when it talks about not having relationships at work, but more importantly, not having affairs at work. What we know is that the statistics are pretty awful about this and that the workplace has become almost the number one place for married people to engage in infidelity. And what's the reason for that? The reason for that is that when you're at work and you have common interests and common experiences, you're going to draw closer to the people at work. That's why people will talk about the work almost being a second family. The sad part is that I probably spend more time at work than I do at home. That's because I work long hours, I love what I do, and it really brings me a lot of joy. But that also, it means that there's a lot of time away from home. Unless there is a great deal of confidence in your relationship and it feels very secure, when you have someone that travels for work or spends a great deal of time at work, there's a susceptibility that occurs with affairs. Because common experiences do bring closeness. So what we have to do is have someone that is so secure in their marriage, in their relationship, that knows that this relationship provides you with all of the attachment needs that you need and that there's nobody else out there 
that can give you as much confidence and a good enough feeling of being loved more than your partner. And we know that this comes and goes sometimes. So how do we have and establish a marriage, a relationship where this is not an issue? And if it does come up, if there is an affair, how do we cope with it? How do we manage it? How do we understand it? How do we deal with all the feelings that come from knowing that your partner has developed feelings for another human being that's not you? And there is a particular wrinkle with workplace affairs because if an affair is discovered, what do we do about it? And what happens if the primary breadwinner, the person that brings home the most income, has an affair with someone at work, and in order to break off that contact, it requires leaving their job or having an experience where the person who had the affair agrees to discontinue that relationship, but has to work with that person every single day. Those are some of the complications here. And that's what we're going to be addressing, how to cope with it. And then more importantly, how do we recover from it? And the question that always comes up is, if once a cheater, is there always a cheater? And should I just leave and end the marriage? Those are some big, serious questions that we hope to discuss during this episode. One of the reasons that I became a couples counselor, particularly with the emotionally focused therapy model, is I needed to find something that address the feeling of loneliness and emptiness that people experience. That is really why people have affairs. Affairs used to be thought primarily are a sexual act. But what we have learned through all this research we've now done is that primarily, although there are some, most people are not having affairs for a physical relationship. The feelings of emptiness and being alone is what causes the affair. And at the workplace, where people are drawn together and working together, what happens is you begin to have a relationship. Harry Met Sally had the best sort of clip that I ever saw on affairs. And, you know, the whole question that he was asking in the movie was, can men and women just be friends? Or is there always that sexual connotation? And the scene that always comes up for me is the scene in the restaurant where there was the whole discussion of faking it. And what happens in the workplace is people begin just to being flirtatious. You know, your partner's not around. There's a pretty girl. So why not just sort of flirt? And then what begins is a conversation. You begin to talk about things. But what happens as time goes on, and I think for most of people, the beginning stage is a friendly conversation. It's not meant to be hurtful. It's not meant to cross a boundary. It's just meant to be friendly and nice. And you begin to talk. And then what happens is things at home become difficult. And more and more, the conversations become a deeper friendship. And the discussions turn into intimate discussions, discussions about your personal life. And as those discussions continue and problems at home continue, the feelings of emptiness and loneliness, you begin to look to the partner that you're having this conversation with in a very different way. And then the flirting becomes much more intimate. And then gradually... If the situation presents itself, people begin to cross a boundary. What we know is the distance between people meeting someone at work and having those kinds of casual dialogues and that first kiss takes a while. There's a big distance there. And what happens mentally is people begin to start having these sort of fantasies about the partner thinking about them, having dreams about them. And more and more, it becomes a much more serious thing in their head, in their minds, and you find yourself looking forward to meeting them. And that's where 
the intervention really needs to become is you begin to need to talk about and recognize how much trouble you're in. Because what we know is that that distance for the first kiss is a while, but from the first kiss to ending in bed together happens quickly. The thing to keep in mind is this is a slippery slope. What I mean by that is that there are lots and lots of choices along the way. Choices about how to handle the conversations, choices about what you should share or not share when you're at home. And one of the keys that I always like to bring up to folks is that if the conversation that you're having with this person is not something that you mind being recorded and to have your wife or husband or partner listening to it or watching a videotape of it, then you're having an inappropriate conversation. It has to be all above board. Now, I'm not saying that a workplace affair is inevitable. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we need to recognize that we all have attachment needs. And if our attachment needs are not taking place at home with our partner, we will seek out somewhere that it does. And quite often that will lead to something inappropriate. So what we need to really do is have a clear guideline of how to prevent this in the workplace. And there's some keys to that that I want to go over. One of the things to keep in mind is almost anybody can have an affair if the situation is right. That doesn't mean we're all weak. It just means that when loneliness is there, when you're feeling empty, your need for connection and closeness is valid and can put you in that situation where the temptation is very, very difficult. So with that in mind, if you recognize that anyone at any time can have an affair, you need to protect your relationship and protect your marriage. Now, how do we go about doing that? One way of doing that is to have certain rules that will allow you to really protect your relationship. One of the first rules is never take a first step in flirtation. You don't want to flirt with people at work. That opens up the door to possible problems. When you're going out and you're going to be at social functions, never have more than one drink with people from work, if even that. I think that people who drink at work, at work social settings, can potentially put yourself in a situation that is difficult. The other thing, and this is, gets somewhat difficult, is never allow yourself to really have a special relationship with a member of the opposite sex. I talked earlier about how Harry Met Sally. Harry Met Sally was a movie. It was a jest. But one of the things that it did point out is that it is a difficult thing with different feelings and men and women in the workplace to really keep in mind that there is chemistry that gets developed and it can be very overpowering. So what I would absolutely recognize is that the old cliche of, I've heard people throw this term around quite a bit, which is that's your work spouse. That's dangerous. There is no such thing as a work spouse, and if they have the feelings of a work spouse, sooner or later there's something inappropriate that could occur. So you want to turn away from anything like that. And unless it's a requirement of a meeting, you should never go and have coffee or really do anything in a separate setting alone with a member of the opposite sex Again, I would say, similar to what I said earlier, if you're not comfortable with your wife seeing a videotape of you and this person and the conversation that you had, then you need to not do it. The next part of this is how do we prevent them? I think some of the rules that I just talked about is the other thing to really keep in mind is you need to have a relationship at home that is fulfilling. If there is people at work, if there are situations that you find yourself in, that you find yourself drawn to someone else, you need to go to your partner and let them know 
that you're feeling empty and alone. That maybe will require you seeking out some professional help. But this is an area that you don't want to mess around with. And this type of infidelity can really create such a major devastation in a marriage, in a relationship. Because people who have affairs at work are put into a terrible situation once it's discovered. So what do we do? Because we all have choices. That's the thing that really is interesting to me. I always hear things like, I don't have a choice. I have to stay with this person. I have to work with this person. What do you want? Do you want me to quit my job? Well, you want to know the truth? The answer is yes. The answer is, if you made a choice to have an affair, you need to live up to the consequences of the affair. And for many of us, and for many families, this could be absolutely devastating. But how do you expect your partner to really be comfortable with you still being at work with somebody that you had an affair with? It may require you resigning your position, seeking work elsewhere, and financially, it could be a very difficult situation. But this is where the choice comes in. Which would be worse? A divorce, which is going to have an incredible financial impact, or having to find another job in a job maybe you don't like as much, maybe it has less prestige. But I think all of these consequences need to be thought about before you have an affair, because an affair is probably the biggest relationship injury that any marriage or any relationship has to overcome. But what I want to make sure that I'm clear about, though, you can overcome it. You can come back from this type of relationship injury. That's where emotionally focused therapy is just so powerful because we now know how to connect people in such a deep way so that what you're creating at this point is not the old relationship that didn't have the affair because that relationship had the possibility of an affair. But you need to create a deep connection with your partner that neither one of you would ever be interested because the vulnerability that you have allows you to open up and let your partner know if you're unhappy including that you may be attracted to someone at work. Just imagine doing that. The pain of that may be great, but which pain is worse? The pain of telling your partner that you're attracted to someone or the pain of your partner either discovering an affair or you needing to say that you're having an affair. I guarantee you the anger and the devastation will be less if you're telling your partner you're thinking of having an affair not that you're already in one. I think some spouses believe that they can handle this. I haven't seen one yet. So I really recommend leaving the position or moving on. The other thing is you need to be totally unhonest with your partner. This is not a place to sugarcoat anything. You need to be as open and honest as possible to give your partner a chance to rebuild any of the trust that they have, trickling out different things like, oh, I forgot to tell you this, or oh, I forgot to tell you that. That's not going to work here. That will blow this relationship out of the water, and it could be unsolvable. So you need to really take some time with one another where you are totally and radically honest with that person. You do need to be sympathetic and loving. This is an area that your spouse is hurting on a very deep level, and you need to be able to sit with them with the anger that they have and allow them to express it, express it in any form necessary, through text, through writing, through pictures, any way that you can. You need to just really sit and be there for your partner who's going to be sharing very difficult and painful feelings and a lot of anger. What we say with, as an emotionally focused therapist is that we need to go through the anger to the pain. Sometimes it takes really expressing that anger to really allow yourself to get in touch with the hurt. That is critical because that's where the connection needs to be rebuilt at that place, at the place of pain 
understanding the attachment needs and really working together very hard to really establish a relationship that's open and vulnerable. Now, for the person that was injured, for the person whose partner had the affair, you need to let go. Now, this is not easy. In order to move on, you need to allow your partner a chance to come back because this is the first and most essential thing. If you have made a decision to stay in the marriage, to stay in the relationship, you have said that this being part of your history is okay. Don't do something that contradicts that decision that you made. Because the more you hold on to this and say, you need to prove this to me, you're really not living up to the commitment that you've made, that you're going to work toward letting go and going to allow this to be part of your history, knowing that you need to create something different in order to move forward. And those things that are necessary to move forward is number one, you have to have total transparency. This is not a place where you can just say that you're doing okay when you're not. You need to be totally transparent and letting your partner know how you really feel. The next one is probably the most difficult one. And that is, if you're going to be in a relationship, a marriage, an intimate relationship with someone that's had a sexual affair with somebody else, you need to allow yourself to be intimate with that person. So your partner and you need to continue to have a sexual relationship. You can't just say, we're not having sex forever. You have to move beyond this piece, and there is a lot of issues that come up here. Things like HIV tests, Things like really making sure that there was no sexually transmitted diseases. I really want all of you who have a partner that's had an affair to require them to take an HIV test because people will tell you everything is fine. You never know. So I don't want anyone contracting any sexually transmitted diseases, HIV and others, because you don't want to ask for this. It's highly recommended by this couple's expert. But you also have to make time for your affection and really putting into place time together where the two of you are able to have an increase in the affection for one another. And that may be the last thing that you want to do. But this is really the challenge. You need to try to put yourself back into the situation where you and your partner are sharing a closeness and intimacy. That may take some time. So I'm not giving a timeline with this, but these are the things that you need to really try to do. You have to put 100% energy and effort into turning this relationship into something that both of you and you have to be willing to hear about your partner's emptiness and loneliness and what went into the decision for their having this relationship. I encourage all of you to really take this slow. There is no timeline. But at the same time, you need to get to a place where you can heal because if it takes too long, you can be sealed up in your anger and misery, and then this relationship will not be recoverable. And I want that for all of you. A question that I always get is, how long will this take? And it's really different for everyone, but there is some general timelines. And so I want to go through, lastly, some of the stages that come into a recovery after an affair the first stage, obviously, is the discovery of the affair. Some of it, what makes a difference is how you discovered it and whether or not this is the first time that this has been an issue in the relationship. You do have to make sense of why your partner cheated and a little bit about what 
the frailty in the relationship has been and what are some of the areas that make this relationship vulnerable to having an affair? After the discovery, there is a grieving phase. This is the emotional reaction to my whole world is upside down and changed. It's part of the recovery issues with that have to do with is that other person still in the picture? If this is a work affair, is that person still working in the office? Is your partner still there? And you need to allow yourself to grieve both for the relationship as it was and the recognition for a lot of couples was how unhealthy the relationship had been and all the work that needs to go into that. After that becomes an acceptance. And this is the period of time where you're ready to move forward from having all that pain and anguish. And each person has a different perspective on what encompasses acceptance. Acceptance to me isn't just accepting the fact that you had an affair in the relationship. Acceptance is that this affair has been a part of the marriage and that the two of you are now aware that the relationship that you had had a component of it that was pervasive and not okay and that there needs to be some work in changing the nature of the relationship from one where there was the possibility of an affair to now having a transparent, authentic relationship where the two of you are totally connected and know that you're with that person that loves you more than anyone else. And lastly is a reconnection where you now have that new relationship and now you can really call yourselves a we, that we're, we have each other's back, we know we're with somebody that cares about us, and we know we're going to make it through this. And then the other aspect of this that I always like to talk about is the maintenance phase. And that is when you've had an affair in the marriage or in the relationship, your relationship is never really the same. So what you need to do is really stay on top of things and making sure that you're always open, you're always vulnerable, you're always talking about the things that bother you. And I absolutely believe that people that have had a relationship injury like this in their marriage, in their relationship, need to do ongoing regular checkups with a counselor, find a counselor that you develop a relationship with, and at least every six months for the first couple of years, go in, talk with the counselor, talk about the relationship, make sure that the relationship is still open and vulnerable. And if you do all of those things, you'll know that this marriage, that this relationship is now better as a result of this injury because the two of you have worked so hard and worked together to develop a relationship that you know that you're with someone who's going to last a lifetime. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode with your host, Stuart Fensterheim. You're one step closer to reigniting that fiery passion with your partner. For more information and your 30-minute free phone consultation with Stuart, visit www.thecouplesexpertscottsdale.com. We'll see you next time.